Water in a piston cylinder assembly executes a Carnot power cycle. Property values are given in the table where state one, this is state one right here, is the beginning of the isothermal expansion. Well, whenever you see Carnot, what do you jump? You think completely reversible cycle, right? And you have isothermal expansion followed by adiabatic expansion, followed by isothermal compression, followed by adiabatic compression. So those are the four processes. And so state one is the beginning of the isothermal expansion. So from one to two, you have isothermal expansion. From two to three, you have adiabatic expansion. From three to four, you have isothermal compression. And from four to back to one is adiabatic compression. That all has to be what's rolling around in your mind. I understand this cycle. We talked about it. There you go. Okay. Now, uh, the property values are given state one, state two, state three, state four. You have the pressure, the temperature, that's in degree C, sorry, not Kelvin, the quality, the specific volume, the internal energy, and the enthalpy. And they want you to sketch the cycle on a PV diagram. Well, state one is saturated liquid, and state two is saturated vapor. All right. So how do I sketch that PV diagram? How about if I do this? I'll take three minutes. I'm going to pause. I want you to sketch the PV diagram using this information in the table. And I'll see how many people get really close or spot on. All right, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and sketch on a pressure volume diagram. And you could put your units on there. We're going to talk pressure in kilopascal and specific volume meters cubed per kilogram. And if you want to try and draw it realistically, it's got to be very sharp and very, very kick out that tail on that side. And then you think, okay, where it's a line of 250 degrees C, oh, that's my high temperature. It's got a pressure of 3976 bar. It's, it, the pressure is way up here. And the, 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 it goes from saturated liquid to saturated vapor, state one to state two, along a line that is 250 degrees C. Now, um, if somebody says, can you extend that line of 250 degrees C outside the dome, constant temperature? You can. It's not. The cycle is only operating between state one and two shown on this diagram. But what would the line of 250C look like outside the dome? Would it do this? Click our question. Would it do something like this? Go straight across. Answer A. Would it do something like this? Come up, go across, then out. Answer B. Or would it do something like this? Come down, go across, and go out. Answer C. There you go. Is it answer A, B, or C, a line of constant temperature of 250 degrees C? What does it look like? All right. Everybody's in. Let's take a look. Actually, we did pretty good as a class, better than I thought, maybe. Right? So, congratulations. Uh, one thing maybe that helps you is think about this. Way out here, it, it behaves as what type? An ideal gas, true? And on a PV diagram, what does a line of constant temperature look like on a PV diagram? Does it go up on a PV diagram? Is that what a line of constant temperature does, like B going up? No, it does that. So it's curving down. There's a, little there's a little concavity to it, but I didn't emphasize that. So C is the right answer. Let's get rid of all this. Okay. Now, it's going to go from expansion from 2 to 3. That's at adiabatic expansion. And trust the numbers here. It's going to go to a much lower line of temperature at 60 degrees C and state Three will be something like that. It'll come out like that. 
this exact shape of the curve? We don't know about that. It's just kind of connect those points. And then it goes back to state four and then up to state one again. And that completes our cycle. So that's our cycle. One to two, two to three, three to four, four to one. We already described each of those processes. Sometimes you'll put a little hash mark right in that, hash mark right in that. What's that indicate? Adiabatic. No heat transfer from two to three. Yes? Wouldn't the volume uh, change, well, at point four still be a lot larger than point one? Yeah, it is. And the only way to do that is to really kick that, that side way out. And so it's like I almost put this on a log scale to make it look reasonable. But still, it should be, should be, st state four, you're saying, should be way over here. And three should be way, way, way over there. But um, let me have artistic license. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good point. All right. So now that we have a sketch of the psych on a PV diagram, evaluate the heat transfer and the work for each process. So really, we want to think about the process here. We already have them labeled and described. So let's build the table up here, Q and W. So I need Qs, 1 to 2, W 1 to 2, Qs 1 to 3, well, W 2 to 3, true? Now, of those eight values, two of them are 0. What two are 0? Yeah, so it's Q 2 to 3, it's adiabatic expansion, and Q 4 to 1, it's adiabatic compression, they're both zero. Okay, how am I gonna get either Q or W for the process one to two? How would I get either Q or W for the process one to two? Suggest a strategy. Yeah, so the work, uh, the work one to two is always PDV, true? This is a, in a piston cylinder assembly. If there's boundary work, it's because it expands, you know? And so uh, notice that we like to do this to calculate that integral PDV, if possible. And uh, is it possible from state one to two? Sure is. And so, is it really that easy, Professor, that it's just this P high times V2 minus V1? Sure is. And so, when we stick in our numbers, we're going to come in with 194.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Maybe I put up here kilojoules per kilogram and over here kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, now, now that I know the work one to two by the definition of boundary work. How do I get Q one to two? Energy balance, and so what we find is that Q one to two minus W one to two is equal to U two minus U one. Okay, let me look. Is uh, U two equal to U one? Hey, they're at the same temperature, they're both 250. <coughs> When it was an ideal gas, that's true. But here we have a two-phase fluid, it's water. It's changed phase from saturated liquid to saturated vapor. So U2 minus U1 is not equal to zero. So you can use the two U's with the calculated W, and you can get Q1 to 2, and you can find that it's 1,715 1715.3. Kilojoules per kilogram. Too many digits, but there you go. There's another way to do that. You can use these two values. Huh? How can you use the two values of H? Because you can blend this W over to that side, and you'll get Q1 to 2 for constant pressure heating is H2 minus H1. Will it give me the same answer? It better. Otherwise, we got a big problem. So, okay, 
hopefully you understand that little discussion. Now let's go to process 2 to 3. We already know Q 2 to 3. How do I get the work 2 to 3? Can I get the work 2 to 3 by the integral P dV and maybe pull that P outside the integral? No, no. So what's the strategy for getting the work 2 to 3? First law of thermodynamics for the process, 2 to 3. So what we have is we have Q 2 to 3 minus work 2 to 3 is equal to U 3 minus U 2. Or is it H3 minus H2? I can't remember. Is it U3 minus U2 or H3 minus H2? Internal energy. Internal energy use. So we know that 2 to 3 is 0. And so we get the work 2 to 3 is negative of U3 minus U2. Watch out for that negative sign right there. And we can calculate and put in the values so let's go ahead and put in our value of 718.0. All right. Now we go to process 3 to 4. Is the work 3 to 4 equal to the integral PdV? And can that pressure come outside because it's going from 3 to 4? It sure can. And so it's the same strategy. You calculate the work. 3 to 4 is equal to negative 70.7. And then you calculate from the first law, the Q, 3 to 4, negative 1092.3. So you're jumping back and forth. Can I calculate the boundary work from the integral PDV? Great. Can I calculate one of those, either work or heat? Uh, from the first law of thermodynamics. And then now from 4 to 1, that work is going to be from the first law, just like it was up here. So Q uh, 4 to 1 minus the work 4 to 1 is equal to U1 minus U4. That's 0. It's adiabatic. Hence, we can calculate work 4 to 1, negative 218.3. I want to check. How can I check to see if I made an error anywhere? See if Q net is equal to work net. Is Q net equal to work net? So if you sum up this column under the Qs, you'll get 623.0. You sum up the column under the work, 623.0. I have more confidence in my work so far. If there's a difference, look for the error. Okay? So this has to be true. So now we've finished out all of these Q's and W's for part B. If you're asked to do something like that on the exam, just put it in a table. Okay, this is one of those times where we relax the requirement to box your answer. It's in the table good enough. Okay, and now we calculate the thermal efficiency. It's what we want, the work net, divided by QN, the work net was 623.0. The Q in is, that looks like a negative sign up there, but it's not. Those were check marks that I had, right? Is 1715.3. So the thermal efficiency comes in at 36.3%. Somebody says, Professor, this is a Carnot power cycle. I learned that the thermal efficiency is 1 minus Tc over Th. So if I put in 1 minus, here, let me clean this up a little bit, 1 minus 60 for lower temperature divided by the high temperature of 250, I don't get that same thermal efficiency. It's not an absolute temperature. It's in Celsius. If I add the 273 and add the 273, I get the exact same thermal efficiency. I calculate that thermal efficiency to 36.3%. Good to three digits at least. That's the jaw dropping, like, how did that happen? 
Well, wow, that's incredible. True? Have you solved a problem like that before? Let me do this. Let me go to the next slide where I have some of the answers. Same thing. But here are the values for the works and the net. Okay? The works and the heats. So you can read them off a little better.